what kind of church do we want to be? The answer to that question it won't be defined by what I say today, won't be defined by what I say on camera or on a stage somewhere. What will answer that question is how we choose to interact with one another. And if you read the New Testament, you cannot get away from this phrase, this term, one another. Jenny started off this series, One Another, in John chapter 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet and then <clears throat> he washes the disciples' feet and then he turns to them and he says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. For Jesus, what should characterize our interactions with one another is a sacrificial love for one another that reflects the way he has loved us. And in this series, we've been honing in on three aspects of that, three applications for us of that. One is how we love one another in hospitality. Another one was how we love one another in the way we do conflict, because it's going to happen, right? And the final one I want to hone in on today is the way we deal with, the way we approach singleness as a church. And, and my goal, my hope is that the way we love one another, uh, both as people who are married and people who are single, that we would do that in such a way that the world looks on and goes, those guys are the real deal. Those guys really are followers of Jesus. I see it in the way they love one another, in the way they interact. As I think about singleness today, as we address that, we've got to go to 1 Corinthians 7. The reason is because it's the most extensive um, dealing of, of relationships in the whole of the New Testament, perhaps in the whole of Scripture. We have to be a little bit careful with it because there's a lot going on in the background in Corinth. There's a crisis. There's some sort of present crisis going on. Immorality is rife. And also they've been asking Paul questions. And so in this letter, he's answering these questions. And, and that's how he starts chapter 7. But what we can do as we step back from, from 1 Corinthians 7 is we can begin to go, okay, but there are some timeless principles that bubble up to the surface. And those are the things I want to focus on as we head into this Subjects. If you go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 says, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, just as God has called them. Further on, in, in, in verse 19, he says, Keeping God's commandments is what counts. And so what emerges uh, from uh, chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians is that for some people, marriage is the best way for them to live life. And for other people, singleness is the best way for them to live life. But if, but if we understand that both of those things can be true, then we have to understand that our relational status is not the most important thing about us. Which leads us then to what Paul is saying there, that what counts for every single one of us is that we're obeying the Lord. What counts for every single one of us is in whatever relational situation we are in, we are to be people who live as believers in that and live in obedience to Jesus. When you come down then, uh, Paul then goes on to talk about how marriage is temporary. Verse 29 says, What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as, as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. Paul is saying marriage is a thing of this world. It is temporary. Do not become so engrossed in marriage that you miss the, the mission that we have been given that is of eternal significance. We can be engrossed in marriage as married people. We can become the be all and end all, the, 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 the focus, the main relationship in our lives at the expense of, of everything else. But at the same time, you can be single and be engrossed in marriage. You can idolize it as if this is the thing that's going to fulfill me. This is the thing that's going to complete me. Uh, life is almost on hold for me until I get married. We are all in whatever relational situation we are in to pursue the mission that Jesus has given us that is of eternal significance and not become overly engrossed in the things that are temporary. I realize this is a very, you know, 
uh, high level interaction with 1 Corinthians 7. But one of the things I want you to see emerges from this is that both marriage and singleness are good and fulfilling paths in which each uh, and each of which has unique joys and unique challenges. One of the, chan- one of the situ- issues with this is that churches have understood and been acutely aware of the joys and the challenges of marriage. We've set up whole ministries around it. I have a friend in Dallas. He's at a large church. His sole full-time role is pre-marriage ministry. Like churches are geared up for celebrating the joys of marriage and supporting people through the challenges of marriage. And what we've failed to do, I think, over the years is celebrate the joys and serve and support the challenges that are faced by single people in our church. You know, there are joys that we have failed to celebrate. There's an autonomy that single people have. You know, one lady said to me, hey, if I want to spend money, if I want to use my skills, if I want to allocate my time in a particular way, that's between me and the Lord. I don't need to discuss it or negotiate that with anyone. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says that people who are single can be more devoted to the Lord. There's a, there's a focus they can bring in their devotion to the Lord in a way that people who are married can be a little bit divided in that because their, their focus can be elsewhere. Some of the, some of the greatest people in, in in Christian history have been, in church history, have been single people. Think of Corrie ten Boom, think of um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, think about the prolific writing of somebody like John Stott. That was, uh, he was able to do that because he was a single man. Now don't weaponize that. Don't be like, oh, you, you're single, you should be more devoted to the Lord. Let's, let's be careful with that. Every single one of us needs to be devoted to the Lord. But there is some time, I think, available to people who are single that maybe um, it is not available in the same way to people who are married. The problem with us not celebrating and honoring singleness as a church is that it's not celebrated in our culture either. You're not going to find that celebration outside the church. We live in such an overly sexualized age that it's like there's this perception if you are not sexually active, then you are somehow less fulfilled. There's a, there's a lid on your sense of fulfillment in life. But as the church, we should be celebrating singleness more than anyone else. Why? Because the pioneer of our faith was a single virgin man, never dated, never married, never had kids. Yet if I ask you who was the most fulfilled person in all of human history, surely we would say it is Jesus. We've talked a lot over the years about how marriage, in terms of Ephesians talks about it, marriage and, and um, is a reflection of Jesus and the church. But what we have missed is that people who are single also have a unique way in which they reflect Jesus as a single man fully devoted to the Lord um, who lived in obedience to the Father his whole life. At the same time, though, there are challenges that uh, single people face and we have failed to understand them. And I think we have failed to support them properly. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to sort of observe um, people who are single. I've had the opportunity and I've made time to sit down and and listen to people, not only in the preparation for this message, but actually um, uh, in the past as well. I've been interested to learn about this. And I just want to pose some questions that you may have never considered that some uh, single people are asking. I'm not pretending this list is comprehensive um, and I'm also not pretending that these questions are asked by every single person. I just want to give you a flavor of what some people in our church are asking today. When I go to church today, will anyone see me? Who am I going to sit with? When I admit that I'm single, will the conversation suddenly get awkward and be shut down really quickly? Why am I more comfortable as a single person in the workplace than I am in the church. I love the church. I love time that we spend together. It's the loneliness that comes when I go home that hurts. Why are my non-Christian friends more open with their Sunday afternoons than my church family? Why do people who like being alone think they understand the angst of my loneliness? Will anybody else be around to celebrate life's most significant moments with me. I don't know about you, but I can't 
I can't engage with those questions without something deep moving within me. To know that when we gather on a Sunday morning, when we gather in life groups, maybe when we get together for, for parties or celebrations, that there are people in our church community every day who are asking these questions and not finding them properly answered. And so what do we do with that? Where do we go with that? I want you to turn with me to Romans 12. We're going to look at one single verse, and I want to look at that verse through the lens of how we begin to answer those questions as a church so that when we say, what kind of church do we want to be? I think we want to be the church that has answers, great answers, better answers than we've been given so far for those questions. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. So look at that first bit. Be devoted to one another in love. The word love there is where we get the word Philadelphia from. When you think of the cream cheese or when you think of the city in America, it is literally the city of brotherly love or the soft cheese of brotherly love. That word devotion is most commonly used in the context of the devotion, the mutual devotion between a father and a child or sorry, parents and children. And therefore, Paul here in Romans puts our devotion and our love for one another firmly in the context of family, that the church is to be like family. And this isn't just one isolated verse. You'll know that this is a theme throughout the New Testament. But also when you come to like Jesus in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 3, you know, some people come in and they say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. And, he's, and he looks at the people around him and he says, the, uh, whoever does the will of my father, these are my, my mother. These are my brothers and sisters. When you come to Psalm 68 verse 6, it says, God sits the lonely in family. And so we cannot escape that Old and New Testament. The theme of Scripture is that the people of God are to be like a spiritual family. And the problem is we have treated marriage and family like they're forever things. But marriage is a thing of this world. I remember the day when I first realized, man, I'm not going to be married to Jenny forever. When Jesus returns or when one of us passes away, our marriage will be over at that moment and it's never coming back. But I remember sort of being slightly offended by that. Marriage and family are temporary. There are, thing, there, are, there are people who are in my family right now who don't know the Lord and my relationship with them will, sit, will cease if they never know the Lord when one of us dies. But the people who are in my church community who genuinely believe in Jesus, these will be my family. These will be my brothers and my sisters forever. And so if we understand church as family, what are the implications for us? What would be different about the way you approach church community if you were to see one another as family? I think it means we need wider front doors. I think we need lower fences. I think we need freer calendars. I think we need longer dining room tables for Jenny and I. It's meant opening up Sunday lunch, opening up Sunday afternoons for people to come around. There's families, there's couples, there's all single people in our home. Most Sundays, I want that to be the case. It's meant we've opened up holidays at times and invited single people to come on holiday with us if they wanted. Nobody's taken that up yet. I don't know what that says about us and our holidays. We've opened up Christmas beyond just our blood relatives, because we want to make sure our lives are open to people who maybe don't have the same family as I have the joy and the luxury of having around me. I've asked, uh, asked a single lady in our church a few months ago, you know, how have you seen this successfully done in your life? She says, there was a family that I was really close to and I was able to open up my life with, share my life with, and they shared their life with me. And what I love about it was the, the, the family sharing their lives with her. What they were going through at that time was struggles over children. But it was fine for my single friend to, 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 to share those, to have those struggles shared with her. That wasn't taboo. That wasn't a weird thing. But there was this opening up of lives with one another. And she thought that was, that was singleness in the context of family done really well. And here's one of the other things I've learned over the years. 
Single people value and want to honor marriage in the same way as we want to try and grow in honoring singleness. I love the fact that there are ladies in my children's lives who are like aunties to them. And they've looked after the girls when Jenny and I have been away on retreats or Jenny and I have been away uh, to have some time together. They have wanted to support and honor our marriage. I'm humbled by that, even though maybe they want to be married themselves. What would it look like for us if we treated church community, the people in our church, as family and actually greater family sometimes than our own blood relatives Let's look at the second part of the verse. It says, honor one another above yourselves. Honor the people uh, in our church more than yourselves. Now that the language there is mutual. And so it sort of means we're creating this race to the top. I'm trying to honor people above myself. They're trying to honor me above themselves. And where there's a sort of race for the top, what a different environment that is when we're honoring one another in that way. What a different environment that is than us coming and trying to honor ourselves. Isn't that different? So what does it look like for us to honor uh, people who are single in our church community? I think it means celebrating singleness in a right way. I think it means understanding that marriage is not the pinnacle of discipleship. It is not the be all and end all. It's not even the most fulfilling way to live life. There is a way that single people can experience fulfillment. And so there's nothing lacking. We can celebrate the fact that Jesus was a single man. Paul was a single man. And there is a unique way in which we as a church can reflect Jesus in the way that, we, in the way that single people are able to live and thrive among us. I think we need to listen better. Do we really understand the, the, the experience of single people in our church community? We, we so easily make assumptions at times, but when we listen, we begin to understand that the experience of single people comes out. People are single for all sorts of reasons, and therefore their experience of singleness and interaction with church community can be really difficult. Every time we gather, there are people who are single because they've just not reached the point where they're thinking of marriage yet. There are people who are single and they're still single and, and, and they really don't want to be. There are people who are single because they made a mess of marriage. There are people who are single because somebody else made a mess of their marriage. There are people who are single in our church because they've been married a long time and and suddenly somebody passed away and now they find themselves single all over again. And I want to suggest that the needs of somebody in their 40s who is still single and doesn't want to be might be very different from the needs of somebody who's been married for 40 years and then has to walk into church as a single person having just left the funeral of their their husband. If we listened long enough to understand the needs of people that we might know how to celebrate and know how to honor them and know how to support and know how to serve. Can you see why I'm not trying to give answers today? I'm just showing us ways that we can make progress. But what is going to define us from here on out is not what I say, but how we choose to respond to what we're talking about. One of the things I love as I've thought about these things of what does it look like to love one another in the context of family? And what does it look like to honor one another? What I love is that embedded in in Maori values is things like manakitanga and whanaunatanga. You know, manakitanga is this idea of kindness and honor and respect. Manakitanga literally means, or embedded in there, is this literal meaning of to raise the mana of somebody else. And so as you think of this mutual sort of honoring of one another, there is something in manakitanga that we can learn from. Think of Fanonatanga, this idea of sort of wider community based on shared beliefs, this sort of wider community where, where we're, you know, brothers and sisters, mothers and, and fathers, um, aunties, uncles, cousins, where there's no sense of this is mine and that's yours, but where everything is sort of shared and open for the common good. Like when I think of those principles, doesn't that sound like the church in hats? Doesn't that sound this idea of all the believers were together and it had everything in common? Doesn't that sound like it? And one of the things I just that grieves me 
is that these values were deeply embedded in Maori culture long before the gospel came and missionaries came from the West, from a so-called enlightened culture, that, we, that Christianity entered this country from a cultural context that was way more individualistic and, and saw Pākehā culture as, as better, as superior to Maori culture. And yet embedded within the culture already, like God put them there with these, with these values that I think can be deeply Christian. And so what does it look like for us to learn from the culture that was already here and say, what would it look like for us as a church to embrace these values of manakitanga and whananatanga? And I'm not trying to say we should be Māori. I'm not like I should be Māori. I'm not trying to sort of culturally appropriate things. I'm just saying I think there are things that are done well already in our culture that we as the church can can um, learn from and actually if we understand the value and dignity of, of humanity that we have because we are Christian, I think we can do them even better together. What would that look like? And so what kind of church do we want to be? Let me close with this. There are clearly some steps that you and I need to take and we gather our shared value as a community, is that we believe God himself, the Son of God, took on human flesh, entered the pain and the frailty and the difficulty and the struggle of human history and died on the cross in our place, that we might be adopted into the family of God, that we might become joint heirs with Jesus, that we might become brothers and sisters with one another. If Jesus went to those lengths to make us brothers and sisters, what are the lengths that you are willing to go to, that we are willing to go to, to embrace our spiritual brothers and sisters as brothers and sisters, where it's not just a theological truth that we believe, but a reality that is lived out among us as church community. Can I pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much. For people who are single in our church community, I thank you that there's a unique way in which they reflect you. I want to thank you for the gift they are to this church community. And Lord, I want to pray today that we would love one another as you have loved us. I want to pray that the way we, the way we celebrate the joys and serve the struggles of marriage would reflect you. I pray that we, the way we celebrate the joys and serve the, the challenges of singleness would also be a way that we, 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 we love you and reflect you. And I pray that we will be willing to, to embrace the, the pain of conversation at times, the difficulty that's going to come as we listen to the stories of one another and we learn better how to honour one another and serve one another. Lord, I pray that we will become a church community that the world is able to look at and say, that is community done in the most amazing way. The Jesus you believe in must be real. I want to know him. Lord, would that be the testimony of this church. And so help us to be humble enough to take the steps we need to take today. I pray in your name. Amen.